Well, good evening and welcome. Um, we uh, have a great program as ever. Uh, I have no particular hand in program, but it is wonderfully uh, put together. Um, and we we have a student speaker to start, um, and that is Clayton Roberts, who's based at the Institute of Astronomy. And he's going to be talking about missing methane. So, um, Clayton, you're, I think you're in Amsterdam this evening. Yes, I am. Yep. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Right. So, yeah, my name is Clay. I'm a PhD student at the uh, Institute of Astronomy. And um, I was fortunate last year to be uh, one of the recipients of the CESAR Award. So I'll be giving a talk today titled Missing Methane, Tracking Greenhouse Gases from Space, in which I talk about some of the work that we did in the first year and a half of my PhD, monitoring methane from space by a satellite. So um, why would one want to track methane from space? Well, so let's talk about global warming for a bit. So um, this graph here is showing the um, average global temperature relative to mid 20th century levels over time. And as you can see, this graph is just alarmingly going up and up and up. And this is something we've all heard about before. And it's something that is not abstract for any of us, um, especially for those of you who are resident in the UK last year, you know, we can feel you know, this even, you know, moderate one degree temperature rise every year, you know, very extreme weather patterns are becoming more and more commonplace. Temperature records are being broken uh, summer on summer. And the worst is really yet to come if we fail to kind of keep global warming contained below this 1.5 degree Celsius increase relative to mid 20th century levels. But fortunately for us, um, we know what causes global warming. Um, it's not rocket science. So global warming is caused by an increased abundance of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And a greenhouse gas is any gas that can trap heat that is either reflected or emitted by the earth. So carbon dioxide is a very famous greenhouse gas. Um, its abundance in our atmosphere has been increasing very steadily ever since the industrial revolution. So this is caused by humans, but carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas to contend with. There's also methane to consider. Methane um, is also undergoing a very rapid increase in abundance in our atmosphere. And methane has natural sources coming from livestock or other biogenic sources. But um, the increase of abundance of methane in our atmosphere is also largely driven by the oil and natural gas industry. So if you were to visit your local friendly natural gas power plant. This is something that you might not see because this image was taken by an undercover New York Times investigative journalist who was armed with an infrared camera. So with this camera, they were able to demonstrate that there's this hellish, huge plume of methane that's being emitted from this natural gas plant just directly into the atmosphere. But when viewed with the naked eye, you wouldn't see this. And this caused quite a stir when this was published because you know this plant is really nothing special there's thousands or millions like it all over the u.s and the world and all of these natural gas uh, production plants are to some extent linking or leaking methane into our atmosphere now methane is of particular interest to climate scientists because of the urgency that we now are faced in fighting climate change um if you remember back to the the temperature graph I showed you over time, you know, we have to try and fight to keep this below 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase, or we're going to be having to deal with even more serious runaway consequences than we already are. But we don't have a lot of time to um, try and contain that. We have years. And so we have to try and come up with ways to mitigate the effects of climate change that are rapid. And methane is a very attractive target to make quick gains in this struggle for a couple of reasons. So first is that methane um, only has an atmospheric lifetime in our atmosphere of about five to 10 years. And what this means is that um, if you were able to suddenly just snap your fingers and then any source of methane emission on earth just is gone. Well, this means that within five to 10 years, you would see a very rapid reduction in the uh, concentration of methane in our atmosphere. And that's huge because what that means is that any effort you make on the ground now to kind of mitigate methane emissions will actually result in change within a few years. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, 
has a much, much longer half-life in our atmosphere. And so if you pull this same magic trick where you just suddenly can vanish away all the ongoing sources of emission, wouldn't actually change anything for a very, very long time. So you'd have to rely on things like carbon capture to actively remove CO2 out of the atmosphere. So second reason why methane is a very um, important greenhouse gas to be monitoring and tracking is because pound for pound, it has a much, much greater ability to trap heat than carbon dioxide does about 80 times greater, depending on what metric you use to calculate this. But don't get me wrong, you know, all greenhouse gases need to be tracked and monitored and hopefully uh, reduced in their emissions. But I focus on methane and a lot of people do, and this is why. Um, and these are just some headlines kind of highlighting how, although lots of people in the field have known for years that methane is a very dangerous greenhouse gas, it's not picking up a lot of steam um, at climate summits and in politics. So. How can we go about monitoring these gases? Well, we can put satellites into space. Um, this is a very handy way to monitor emissions because it's independent, it's unscheduled, and satellites like um, Tropomi here, which is the latest and greatest um, greenhouse gas observing satellite, it can look at every spot in the globe once a day. You don't need to rely on um, industry giants in the oil and gas field to report their own emissions. You can look at them directly. And so Tropomi here can observe methane, which is very handy. It can also observe nitrogen dioxide, which is not a greenhouse gas, but it's a very dangerous pollutant. It comes out of the tailpipe of your car. It's produced in combustion reactions. Um, when you have cities like London, which impose like no traffic zones and things like that, NO2 is what they're trying to limit. So Tripomi here was launched by the ESA in 2018. That was the year before I started my PhD. And it can observe methane and it can observe NO2. And so when I started my PhD, I was using uh, available Tropomi data to look at the Permian Basin here, which is in Texas. The Permian Basin is the largest oil and gas producing region in the United States. It's well known and has been well known for a long time to be a huge source of methane emission. So um, given that Tropomi had only been launched about a few months before I started my PhD, it was very, we were very excited to look at this. Um, and so when you use the Tropomi satellite to look down at this oil and gas basin, this is what you see. So you can see this really big red blob over the basin, which is all this extra methane that's kind of hanging around in the area. So it's very bad. But what you can also see is that in this um, snapshot, this daily, just quick little look that you have at the basin, there's a lot of gray space. And that gray space is pixels where the satellite wasn't able to make a direct observation of the methane. And this is caused by something as simple as clouds. Uh, this is very bad because cloud cover is very common in the region and it gets in the way of the satellite making the observation. So this means that the satellite that you've put up into space that's trying to look at methane and monitor methane is now stuck on most days of the year, not actually seeing much. However, the nitrogen dioxide that the satellite can also see at the exact same time it has a much better field of view. And so on the right, this is what the satellite sees of the nitrogen dioxide over the Permian Basin. You can see it still sees a big angry red blob in the exact same spot because of the industrial activity on the ground that's producing the oil and the gas is also producing nitrogen dioxide emissions in the exact same place as the methane emissions. But cloud cover doesn't get in the way of the nitrogen dioxide emissions. And so the spatial coverage is much greater. And so we thought, well, what if there was a way that we could develop some kind of model that could learn the extent to which these two pollutants are related to one another. And how strong is the correlation between the overabundances of these great big clouds of NO2 and methane? So that's precisely what we did. We developed what uh, is called a linear Bayesian hierarchical model, which we can train using satellite data to learn the extent to which the NO2 and the methane overabundances are related to one another on a daily basis. And this means that we were able to train this model, which could then make predictions about methane abundances and transform a daily observation, which looks something like this into something that then looks like this. And so the spatial coverage of the methane data product is dramatically increased, which was a huge win. And so we were then able to apply this model uh, to a year's worth of satellite data. And we found that we were able to augment the satellite spatial coverage of the basin to just about 100% on every single day. And we believe that this was the most extensive um, estimation of methane over this you know, highly targeted industrial region to date.
So we wrote this up and we published it in a paper, uh, which we were very excited to share. And um, um, I then presented this to the Caesar Award, which I was very um, grateful to receive. And then with the money from the Caesar Award, I then was able to come here to Amsterdam and continue my research with some collaborators at TU Delft, uh, among other places where we're now uh, working on how to use these enhanced data products to then estimate methane emission rates from these oil and gas basins. I think that's just about 10 minutes. I hope you could all hear me when I was talking. <laughs> um, I guess I now have time for questions, um, if there are any. Hey, thank, thank you. That was a, um, a beautiful talk. Um, rather depressing, but, but fantastic. Uh, we do have uh, some time for questions that um, both in the real audience and maybe online. Um, so can I, let me sort of start. Oh, um, well, well, let me ask a quick question. I mean, methane doesn't give a very large infrared absorption, does it? Because it's not very polar. Was it all right? I mean, NO2 is an easier molecule to see in infrared. It is. Um, I So Tripomi has multiple spectrographs on board. And I can't speak super strongly about exactly which wavelengths the NO2 is being um, observed at. I know it's much more visible shifted um, than the methane ones. And the absorption bands for the methane that they're looking at are somewhere in the infrared. But the reason that the cloud covers um, getting in the way of it is that it's a it's overlapping strongly with the water absorption bands, which is okay. Why that's I think a, a question at the back. Yeah. Okay, this is a bit of speculation. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, can you think of a reason why, when the gas pipeline was ruptured by whatever means, it wasn't ignited on the surface? Because it seemed to me that the amount of methane, which, as you say, is very much more stronger greenhouse gas. Could have been ignited on the surface, and carbon dioxide would have been far less of a. Problem. Are you are you speaking about the Nord Stream sabotage? Yes, yes. Ah, uh, well, I mean that would have been pretty cool, um, if someone had wandered out there with a big lighter and done that. Um, I guess it. So, like these flares I'm showing on this end slide here, I, I guess the the reason it's very, I first of all I agree, yeah, it's better to combust it to the CO two, and that's why they do this, but. For that Nord Stream stuff, I, even though it was a huge bubble and a huge amount of concentration, I'm not sure if it would have been actually focused enough to ignite it and try and turn it into CO2. Sounds like a Michael Bay kind of thing. John, you want to? Thanks, Clayton. Great talk. But I noticed in the um, picture you showed, there was a very strong NO2 um, source on the left-hand side that mm -hmm. clearly you you managed not to convert that into a, a methane. Yes, there you see it mm -hmm. in the right-hand picture. Yep. Um, and I'm yep. quite intrigued about that. I believe that's, I think it's Juarez. So cities show up quite strongly on this as well. And so this paper did have a significant section that had to be included after reviewers um, feedback, which is how can you be sure that um, urban sources of NO2 like cities um, aren't influencing the um, how the model is learning. And essentially the way that we got around that was by constructing um, fairly, not complicated, but like specifically drawn boundaries so that we weren't including these regions when we were building the training data set. So yeah, that wasn't included in the region that the training data set was taken from. But yeah, you're right. The urban sources of NO2, like cities, aren't expected to emit methane at the same rate as like, um, you know, an oil field is. And so it is important to make sure that these things are being kept track of when you're training, training this model. So otherwise you might over predict your methane abundance. This is John Cook. Thanks for a great talk. I was happened to be browsing Science Mac last week, and there was a paper reported there on work in the Netherlands from the Netherlands Space Research Institute using AI to uh, similarly detect methane plumes. Is that a continuation or an addendum to your work, or are you working? Um, I might know them, but that's that's not my work. Um, no. 
Okay, thanks. But it is sort of slightly surprising that um, given that the methane seems to be emitted where there's sort of industrial production going on that they decide to waste it. Is, is that just incompetence or? I think that or, or, or it's what? tough. It's when you know, any sane person would think about, well, for well, yeah, the environmental impact is awful, but yeah, any sane person would say, well, you're being wasteful, you're losing money. This is an industry that is just making money hand over fist in a way that just, it, 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 the system is just, it doesn't apply. It doesn't matter that they're wasting okay, it. Okay, right. <laughs> so, so we're going to get ourselves depressed at this point. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so Clay, th thank you very much. That was just, just the sort of... Uh, snapshot that uh, brings things to life thank you so much and uh, thank you very much for having me ongoing research yeah